Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Jeremy Coburn. Jeremy is a PhD candidate in linguistics with a concentration on African languages and linguistics at Indiana University in the USA. He is a field linguist with an emphasis in phonetics and phonology, interested in typologically uncommon speech sounds, language conservation, and the description of East African languages. His dissertation research focuses on the phonetic and phonological description of Hadza, an endangered language isolate spoken in Tanzania using traditional linguistic fieldwork and novel instrumental methodologies. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy as he gives his talk, Laryngeal Contrast and Voice Onset Time in Hadza Stops, Africans and Clicks. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction and welcome all to my talk, which has, has just been said is entitled Laryngeal Contrasts and VOT in Hadza Stops, Africans and Clicks. And before we begin today, I do want to preface this talk in saying that this is a small part of ongoing dissertation, my dissertation research. Um, so I appreciate you all being here and I look forward to getting some of your feedback and questions and comments, critiques at the end of this talk. So to begin today as a bit of a roadmap for how we will approach today's research, because I am aware that some listeners may not be familiar with different aspects of today's topic, I will provide some important background information. First, I give an overview of the language of study, which is Hadza, and I will situate it geographically and also typologically and introduce its interesting segmental inventory. And then, as is evident in the title of today's talk, we will discuss what we mean when we talk about laryngeal contrasts, for those who are unfamiliar, and what kinds of laryngeal systems exist in the world's languages. We then will talk about the usefulness of voice onset time, shortened as VOT, as a parameter by which we may describe these laryngeal contrasts in language. And with that background, I will present some past descriptions of the Hadza laryngeal system and introduce my current research objectives and what the data are that we are using for today's study. Finally, we will look at the results and the conclusion. So geographically, the Hadza language is spoken in the area around Lake Easi in the Tanzanian Rift Valley, as is well known to you all, given our collective interests in the languages and cultures of the Rift Valley, Hadza is spoken in a region with a rich language ecology, with languages from different language families spoken in the surrounding regions. As is shown in this image, this map taken from Kiesling et al. 2008, the Hadza speaking area being marked in red here around Lake Easi. Hadza itself is a language isolate, meaning is unrelated to any other known language and is likely spoken by around 2000 people in this area. The Hadza people have traditionally practiced a hunter-gatherer subsistence lifestyle and many today still participate in foraging activities. The Hadza speakers today reside in numerous camps and villages in the region around Lake Easi. This map borrowed from Andrew Harvey shows some of the communities where large numbers of Hadza reside. For this study, I worked with speakers from the communities marked in the boxes. And you'll notice that there are different colors here in Mangola in kind of an burnt orange, Monguamono in red, and then Sengede and Hukumako in purple. The reason for this differentiation is that these kind of represent what the Hadza consider as different subregions of the Hadza community, uh, where Sengede and Hukumako patterned together in one of the, the, the four. We talk about four different subregions. My research focused on the three that are marked here in this map. Hadza is widely known for its large consonant inventory and use of cross linguistically uncommon speech sounds, such as phonemic click consonants ejectives and lateral obstruents. 63 phonemes are included in the constant inventory shown here. However, this inventory as shown here represents my present analysis of the language and is by no means undisputed. In just a moment, we will actually look more closely at the laryngeal contrasts included in this consonant chart and discuss the discrepancies that exist in the literature. But first, I thought it would be nice to hear some Hadza as spoken by two of my good friends. This video recording shows Mariam Anyawire and her younger brother Tumaini. And this video is found in the Hadza Elar collection created by the network members Richard Griscom and Andrew Harvey. 
uh, we had just tested this video recording and we found that the sound is quite a bit quieter than my speaking voice. So once I finish introducing the clip and I'll push play, you may want to increase the volume for the duration of this video just so that you can hear a little bit better. All right, now turning to laryngeal contrasts. Laryngeal contrasts are phonological contrasts that are found in nearly all languages and relate to the state of the larynx or the vocal folds. So the features that are most commonly talked about in, within under the umbrella of laryngeal contrasts uh, are, for example, voicing. So that is voiceless versus voiced sounds, consonants, meaning that in a language that there is a contrast, for example, given here between, say, a voiceless alveolar stop versus a voiced alveolar stop. stop. So ta versus da, with just the, the contrast being uh, the glottal pulsing associated with the voice sound that is not associated with the voiceless sound, so voicing. And then another feature that is, that is that of aspiration, that is some languages contrast voiceless unaspirated stops versus voiceless aspirated stops, so da versus ta has aspiration, or a language may contrast a voiced unaspirated stop versus a voiced aspirated stop. And less commonly under the umbrella of laryngeal contrast, we, what is less commonly talked about is that of glottalized stops. Um, and these mean that there is a contrast in a language between a non-glottalized stop, such as ta, versus a glottalized uh, ejective stop, ta, for example. With these types of laryngeal contrast, these features that are often discussed, there are several possible laryngeal systems that shake out in the world's languages. Uh, for example, famously, there is the distinction between two types of two-way laryngeal systems. Uh, for example, there are so-called aspirating languages, uh, such as English or German, where an, an un underlying phonological contrast in voicing is realized as a difference in unaspirated versus aspirated. So P, voices unaspirated P versus aspirated P word initially for lang these languages. And that's one possible two-way laryngeal system. There are others which are the so-called true voicing languages such as Brazilian Portuguese or Spanish where the underlying phonological voicing contrast is in fact realized as voicing contrast between unas or unaspirated voiceless stop versus a pre-voiced voiced sound. So that is the two-way laryngeal systems. There are also attested widely three-way laryngeal systems. And what this does is it includes, in addition to the voicing contrast, also the aspiration contrast within the three-way system. So an example of this would be Thai, where you have an unaspirated voiceless stop versus an aspirated voiceless stop versus a voiced stop in these three-way laryngeal systems. And Less commonly are four and five way laryngeal systems. Uh, a lot of these, such as Urdu, and uh, the, a lot of these four way systems and five way systems are attested in uh, Indic languages, languages of South Southern Asia, such as in Urdu, where you have a contrast between voiceless unaspirated and voiceless aspirated, and also a contrast between voiced unaspirated and voiced aspirated. I would also include Hadza within these possible four-way laryngeal systems. 
The difference being here that it is a contrast, in fact, between unaspirated voiceless, aspirated voiceless, ejective, and voiced. So the glottalized feature as opposed to an aspiration feature. And there are also much, much less commonly found five-way laryngeal systems. An example of this would be Cindy, where you have voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated, and then voiced unaspirated, voiced aspirated, but also the inclusion of a contrast for an implosive voiced. So with these types of different features that could be associated with laryngeal contrasts, uh, a very important, I'm sorry, an important seminal work that tried to look at a specific single unified tractable phonetic parameter, which could be used to, to describe the, the, these different types of laryngeal contrasts using one's easy to use uh, parameter. Lisker and Abramson, 1964, famously uh, proposed voice onset time or VOT as a possible and very useful in their study way to track these systems. And what VOT actually means is it is a measurement of the elapsed time between the release of some sort of supralaryngeal stop closure and the onset of vocal fold vibration that is voicing associated with a following vowel. So the specific uh, time elapsed between the release closure and the onset of voicing, thus voice onset time. Now, originally this was proposed to describe laryngeal contrast among stops. That's what Lisker and Abramson did in 1964. Word initial stops, do these things hold up? And this was later extended to other consonants, that is like affricates, clicks, um, but also word medially, what happens with VOT that was extended there later. Um, and since this time, VOT has been widely used to describe various laryngeal systems in languages throughout the world. Um, essentially, anytime someone describes a laryngeal contrast in stops or stop-like sounds, uh, VOT is typically uh, invoked. Now, what this actually looks like in practice and what makes it so uh, widely popular is that VOT is very easy to both identify in the speech signal um, acoustically and also to measure. So, for example, VOT, there's two possibilities that are typically talked about. That is the possibility of positive, a, a positive VOT measurement, that me meaning that the, the VOT, the voice onset time, is greater than zero milliseconds. And within this, these positive VOT measurements, we have this dichotomy between short long, or short, sorry, short lag, meaning that there's a lag time between the stop release and the onset of vocalic voicing, and a short VOT, short lag VOT, which is associated with unaspirated consonants, and a long lag VOT associated with aspirated or glottalized consonants, meaning that there's a greater uh, time span between the release of the stop and the onset of vocalic voicing. That is for the voiceless sounds. Then there are also what we call negative VOT measurements. That means that there is a negative value, less than zero milliseconds. And this is associated with voiced consonants that have a lead VOT, meaning that there is pre-voicing before the release of the stop. Now, here are three examples from Hadza specifically of what this looks like. In example A, we have Quatlaco, which is a voiceless, unaspirated, velar, uh, sorry, labialized velar with 25 milliseconds as measured here versus the aspirated labialized velar stop, quatuta, meaning quarry bustard. And here we see that there is a longer VOT of 62 milliseconds. And then the voiced stop, guadiso, and we have this negative value of negative 147 milliseconds, meaning pre-voicing, lead VOT. Now, this is what has been talked about for VOT. That is not to say that VOT is, is not without its critiques, uh, but this is how it has been used. So now with that background, understanding of what laryngeal contrasts are and how VOT is used to uh, describe them, we want to talk briefly about some of the inventory and what has been said about the Hadza inventory. It, it is definitely an inventory disputed within the literature. Tucker, Bryan, and Woodburn, 1977, claim that there is an aspiration 
voicing and ejective contrast for stops and affricates. And as you can see here in this in their uh, consonant chart that you have for the labial and the velar stops, you have a voiceless unaspirated, what they call simple, an ejective, an aspirated, and a voiced version. And in the dental, you have a simple, an aspirated, and a voiced, but no ejective. And then we in the affricates, we get the simple, unaspirated, ejective, aspirated, and voiced, except for the lateral, which does not have a voiced counterpart. So that was originally what was described by Tucker, Bryan, and Woodburn, 1977. They also claim that there is an aspiration and glottalization contrast for, for the Hadza clicks. Here we have, uh, I've shown three, they have five click types described, and we're going to just focus on the three and that will be made apparent soon. Um, but here we have a, a contrast between the simple unaspirated click a, what they call pausal click, which we'll describe a little bit differently in just a moment, and but this is associated with some sort of glottalization and an aspirated click in, in these cases. So they describe it as being this aspiration contrast. Now, Sands, and Madis Sands Madison, and Latifogan, 1996, when they did a study looking specifically at VOT of these sounds, find that there is a significant difference in VOT for the stops. And so you can see in their consonant chart, the plosives at the top, there is this contrast between aspirated, unaspirated, and voiced stops. However, in their study of VOT, they did not find significant difference in VOT for the affricates and clicks, and therefore they conclude that there is no aspiration contrast in the affricates and clicks. Now with that, history in mind. This is the consonant inventory that I've uh, shown you previously and we'll be discussing here. This is the one that I'm working off of. And importantly, what we're describing is that there is a three-way uh, laryngeal contrast in the coronal stops. So that is the alveolar, alveolar place of articulation here in this chart. Um, the stops contrast between unaspirated, aspirated, and voiced. And then the non-coronal stops that there is the addition of the ejective um, where in this in the bilabial, you'll see this is in parentheses, the ejective is in parentheses. That is because this sound is largely restricted to only a few um, lexical items. Then in the coronal affricates, we also have a four-way laryngeal contrast that is unaspirated, aspirated, and ejective, and voiced uh, affricates. And then a three-way three -way contrast in the palatal lateral affricate which means it does not actually have a voiced counterpart. And then there's the three-way contrast in clicks, the unaspirated, aspirated, and then what we call here the glottalized click, um, following Sands et al. 1996, that this, what Tucker, and Bri Tucker Bryan, and Woodburn called uh, pausal, here we're calling glottalized, meaning that there is glottal closure during the click articulation, which is released after the click is released. So there's a period of silence between the click release and the onset of voicing. So this is the contrast that we're looking at today. And what we want to, to determine is these three are uh, research questions. What are the temporal properties related to the laryngeal contrast in Hadza occlusives? Is there a VOT distinction for the aspiration contrast, which was reported for Hadza affricates and clicks, but not substantiated in the research done by Sands et al. 1996? So basically, do we find that do we find now currently a VOT distinction? And with that, the, the final kind of secondary question is, is how do long lag VOT segments? So that is in Hadza, we have this contrast between aspirated clicks, or sorry, aspirated stops, ejectives, and clicks, and glottalized versions. So glottalized uh, ejective stops. Both of these will have some sort of long lag VOT. And we want to know how do they pattern along the VOT continuum, meaning is aspiration longer than the ejectives in VOT or, or vice versa? This is a secondary question that we want to look at today. The data that we are working with for this study uh, is wordless data that was collected in 2022 by myself uh, with seven Hadza speakers. There was six male and one female. Uh, from three of the four Hadza subregions that I explained uh, earlier. Uh, 
and this word list data included nouns that were listed in singular and in plural and kind of depending on how the situation went of that day of data collection it was repeated from one to six times in isolation and then also within a carrier phrase for example one carrier phrase was a uh, which means and noun the the target item na na over there Verbs were elicited in infinitive and an imperative form. Um, in both of these, the infinitive and imperative are created with a suffix, so there's no change to the word initial consonant. And it was repeated two to three times in isolation by each speaker. The target consonants that we were looking at were produced and analyzed word only word initially. We did not look at word medial uh, consonants. And it was all recorded on a Zoom H5 digital recorder with a headset microphone and annotation and analysis was done in prompt. So now getting to the results of the study. Uh, here on the left, we have a table which shows the on the far left, the consonants from labial back to, to labialized velar, unaspirated, aspirated, and voiced for each place of articulation with the number of tokens that were analyzed the average VOT, and this has been average VOT for four speakers, three males, one female, and the standard deviation. And on the right, we have a box and whisker plot, which visualizes what we, we find on the left. And what we find here is that if we just pick out the voiceless unaspirated versus the voiceless aspirated, we find a clear distinction in VOT of short VOT, short lag VOT versus long lag VOT. For example, we get 16 milliseconds for the unaspirated voiceless uh, labial stop versus 52 milliseconds for the aspirated uh, labial stop. For the alveolar stop, we get 16 for the unaspirated and 43 milliseconds for the aspirated. For the velar stop, we get 24 for the unaspirated and 63 milliseconds for the aspirated. And in the labialized velar stop, we get 27 for the unaspirated and 62 for the aspirated. So in this, uh, the findings of this result, we substantiate and, and corroborate what was found for uh, SANS at all 1996, that there is this distinction in VOT between unaspirated and aspirated stops for these speakers. Now adding the additional dimension of the ejective stops. So that was looking specifically only at the voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated, and the voiced uh, stops. Now adding the additional dimension of the ejective stops to see how that patterns. What we find is that the unaspirated stop, unsurprisingly, is the shortest lag VOT of the three, followed by aspirated, and then finally the ejective. So you can see in the uh, bar graph on the right that the unaspirated versus aspirated versus ejective of each place of articulation. And remember here, the only, there is no alveolar ejective, so we're only looking here at the labial and the velar and labialized velar stops. And you can see clearly that there's this distinction this of much longer VOT for the ejectives. Uh, this is again taken from four speakers, three male, one female. However, I did want to uh, make one note here that the labialized velar, sorry, the labial, ejective labial stop is very rare in the language. It's only produced in a few words. And so in the data, we only had uh, this sound produced by one of the speakers, uh, speaker JM from Monguamono. And so that's just an important note as we look at these. So what this finds, uh, this result shows is that there's a uh, corroboration of findings from SANS et al. 1996, they do mention that ejectives are longer than the aspirated. Uh, they don't offer a lot of the evidence of that, but do mention that this is uh, the case. And so we do see that that bears out as well here. Now, interestingly, this does this result does differ from other languages. For example, ejectives in the language Witsui Ten by the study done by Wright et al. 2002 finds that ejectives are actually intermediate between unaspirated and aspirated stops in this language, um, as opposed to Hadza, where the ejectives are actually the longest of the three. Now turning to the pulmonic affricates. So this is what was not found to be contrastive in the earlier research. 
we have the same thing on the left. We have a box here which shows the unaspirated versus aspirated affricates with the number of tokens analyzed, the average VOT for four speakers. However, this is from four, only four male speakers. The female was not included in this data set and the standard deviations. And what we find for the uh, alveolar and post-alveolar affricates, we find a clear distinction difference in, in terms of average VOT between the unaspirated and the aspirated affricates. So you get 59 milliseconds for the unaspirated alveolar affricate versus 134 milliseconds for the, the aspirated version. And then in the post-alveolar affricate, you get 42 milliseconds for the unaspirated and 78 milliseconds for the aspirated. Now, where it does get a little bit uh, murky is in the palatal affricate where here we do see that there is a difference between the unaspirated and the aspirated in terms of VOT, 61 milliseconds for the unaspirated versus 72 for the aspirated. However, we don't get as big of a distinction as what we see for the other two. And so because of that, because of the overlap that you can see is uh, you know, very apparent in the box and whisker plot between these two, I wanted to pull apart the data that we had that, that was used to average this VOT and see if there was anything of interest here. So as an aside, um, for the palatal lateral affricate, what we find is that actually that there is substantial interspeaker variation. So this is for three of the four speakers that we just saw because the fourth speaker what did not actually produce any of these sounds um, in his data set. But for these three speakers, speaker ES, who's from the Tliika area, Sangele area of, of Hadzaland, and he's uh, around 50 years of age, he produces the expected difference. So we can see here his unaspirated affricate is 36 milliseconds uh, versus his, af uh, his aspirated affricate with, has 69 milliseconds of average VOT, which is substantially different than what we get for speakers JM and TA, who were both younger speakers, younger, younger than speaker ES, and they produce a minimal distinction between these two. So we do still see that for these two speakers, the aspirated ones have a longer average VOT, but the difference between them is less substantial, only four milliseconds difference between uh, them in, for JM and only six milliseconds difference between them for TA. So what we see is that there is interspeaker variation. Now, why there's this interspeaker variation, whether this is you know, a loss of contrast or something, that's impossible for me to say at this time, but we do find that there is this differences. So for some speakers, there is a clear distinction between these two. Now, including the ejective affricates, what we find is the same as what we found for the stops, is that the unaspirated, unsurprisingly, is the shortest, has the shortest VOT. The aspirated has the, long, the second longest, so the intermediate VOT, and the ejective has the longest VOT uh, for the affricates. And this also corroborates comments that were made by Sands et al. 1996, where they found the same thing, you know, they comment that they found the same thing um, in their study. So we see here, again, in the, in the bar graph that the ejective has the longest VOT compared to the aspirated and unaspirated counterparts. All right, so now finally turning to the clicks, what we find here is the results for the click VOT study. And on the left, again, we find this is now for, for six speakers. This is five males and one female. And we have the dental unaspirated click, the dental aspirated click, the alveolar, post alveolar unaspirated versus aspirated, and the lateral uh, unaspirated versus aspirated with the number of tokens analyzed, and the average VOT, and the standard deviation. And what we see here is the distinction that we would expect between an unaspirated and aspirated click in VOT. The unaspirated dental click has 46 milliseconds compared to the aspirated 84 milliseconds. And the uh, post alveolar uh, is 39 milliseconds for the unaspirated versus the aspirated 65 milliseconds. And for the lateral 44 milliseconds for the unaspirated and 82 milliseconds for the aspirated. And so we see this also in the box and whisker plot of this distinction between the unaspirated and the aspirated clicks. And now looking at the differences between the unaspirated versus aspirated versus glottalized clicks. Now it should be noted here that 
although this kind of is mix putting them together with the ejective you know trying to compare them as if they were the same as the ejectives of the ejective affricate and ejective stop it should be noted that there is a distinction, a difference between the production of a glottalized click and an ejective stop in Africa. These are not ejective clicks uh, like are found in other languages. These have a glottal closure during the production of the click, which is released sometime after the release of the click. Um, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind. But what we do find is that we find the same patterning as for the uh, the stops in the affricates. So the unaspirated clicks have the shortest average VOT, aspirated clicks have the, the intermediate VOT, and the glottalized clicks have the longest VOT. Um, however, it should be noted that there is minimal VOT difference in, in this, these results between the aspirated dental click and the glottalized dental click. In fact, there's only two milliseconds difference between these two things. So essentially, no, no difference between them. Um, now, it should be, again, mentioned that there is a distinct difference between the production of the glottalized click and like the ejectives, for example. Uh, it is not simply, they, they both have lag VOT, uh, but the glottalized click also has an additional component of having nasalization, voiceless nasalization associated with it, um, as well as differences in the signal of the space of time between the release of the click and the onset of voicing. With the aspirated, we have aspiration, so a spread glottis with ongoing aspiration, as opposed to silence due to glottal closure. It's associated with the glottalized click, so it perhaps is not is not so totally surprising that we don't see as big a difference um, between these two. But it is interesting that we do still find that the glottalized clicks are longer than the aspirated clicks, um, which is consistent with what we found for the other. Uh, the Africans and the stops. And this also corroborates findings from Sands, Sands et al. 1996, where they also comment that the glottalized click has longer VOT than the aspirated. Or in their instance, they didn't call it aspirated, they called it just glottalized versus non glottalized or, or unaspirated. But with our additional uh, dimension of the aspirated, we still find that this is true. So Given those results, the conclusions that we were able to draw from this is one, aspiration is distinctive along the VOT continuum for the stops, as previously described, but also the affricates and the clicks. This resolves discrepancy between previous descriptions of the language, such as Tucker et al. 1977, and the phonetic fieldwork that was done on the language by Sands et al. 1996. Now, though we do find that there is this distinction between them, it is important to note that there is some interspeaker variation. Uh, such as in the aspiration in the palatal lateral affricate, uh, where we found that some speakers produce it more distinctively or more saliently than others do. Um, and also an interesting finding is that glottalized segments have longer VOT than aspirated segments, different than in other languages. And so one of the questions that are interesting to think about or to entertain is a lot of times in terms of VOT, we talk about short versus long lag VOT. But in reality, as I mentioned earlier, VOT is not a perfect uh, phonetic parameter to describe languages or to describe these contrasts. In this instance, would it be better to describe as short versus long versus longer lag VOT when we have the addition of the ejective uh, or short versus intermediate versus long? Um, this is interesting questions to think about in terms of the typology of laryngeal contrasts. Nubea, thank you, and I welcome any questions and comments. For the presentation, so we can go straight into the question uh, section. Um, so we, while we wait for the other participants to uh, come up with a question, I have a curiosity myself. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's primarily about the interspeaker variation. Um, do you have any idea what this might come from? Like, is this something you would expect? Uh, in all locations, or is it maybe specific to a location, through an age group? Can you make any hypothesis about this? Yes. Um, so it has been noted by other people who have worked on Hadza that it seems to be that aspiration is more distinctive for speakers in one location versus another location, whether that's oh, in the north, they tend to have more distinction in aspiration versus the south. I'm just giving it as an example, not specifically that. So 
is there a possibility that this is something in terms of dialectal differences or area differences? That's a possibility. Um, it's also a possibility that it has to do with age. Um, I can't say for any certainty which one it would be, um, but it is an interesting thing to think about. And it is also worth noting that because of the large consonant inventory in this language, finding minimal pairs is essentially a crapshoot. And a lot of times they just don't exist. So for the palatal uh, African, for example, I am not aware of any known minimal pair between these two uh, sounds. So is it possible that it's disappearing? That's certainly possible, but I'm not able to say that with any certainty at this time. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, those sort of follow-up questions. So you mentioned that the, uh, what was it, the ejective labial stop was uh, very rare, only produced by one of your speakers. So I was sort of wondering, did the other speakers not produce these words or did they produce it with just like a simple labial stop or maybe an aspirated labial stop? Yeah, so that's a good question. For this one, the speaker who produced this was the only one who produced a, a verb who that, that has the stop. So pa'u cha, pa'u is meaning to split. He was the only one who actually who I, I elicited that sound, that word from. So that would be the one limitation there. But the other instances where this sound exists, uh, such as in a word, which is a type of bird, the other speakers who I elicited this word from gave me a labialized velar ejective. Um, so they did not produce it with the labial stop, the labial ejective. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I see that yeah. Bonnie has raised her hand. Yeah, Anna, that uh, split word, uh, one of the speakers I worked with had was able to alternate between the uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the the labial and the velar sound. Thanks for your talk, Jeremy. I agree with you. Sans et al. had it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't really have a great explanation for why we, the certainly the number of words that we used was uh, smaller and um, in, in our statistical analysis. And it may have had something to do with the way we recorded the words. People said the word, um, you know, several times and they started probably speaking faster and all those repetition, different repetitions were not treated differently in the analysis. Um, I, I wondered if you want any comments on that. And then my only comment about your talk is uh, when you talk about the glottalized click, you might use the word constriction, glottal constriction, rather than closure, because sometimes it doesn't seem that it's a full closure. Or, and I, you can comment on that if you want. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate it. It's, it's nice to have you here, obviously, and talking about these things for that reason that you were the one that had worked on previously. Um, and I wouldn't say that you had it wrong. I would say that you were looking at different thing, a different data set than what I'm looking at. And definitely the, uh, I, my comment would be that, yes, you're, the number of items that you looked at was less than what I looked at. And given the nature of the large co consonant inventory in Hadza, with, if you only had a certain set of, of sounds or of, of words, you could only get a certain number of sounds. So there are certain sounds that are in my inventory shown here that were never described by Tucker, Brian, and Woodburn, for example, simply because they were only in a few items and so they never encountered them. Um, so my assumption is that had something to do with why you didn't find it in the previous study, but also having listened to the recordings that you used for it, yeah, the, the nature of the recording potentially could have changed it because they would speak you know, more quickly as time went on and they were going through multiple speakers and it kind of seemed like they were rushing as time goes on. So maybe that had something to do with it. And, and another difference is that I didn't measure VOT from the end of the click. I, I measured it from the beginning of the syllable so as to uh, not, you know, because there's a lot of noise, noisiness in the release of a click. So mm -hmm. I was concerned with where do I find the end of the click? So they were measured from the beginning of the syllable and that's a, a bit of a problem because um, DDA Demolan found that the uh, aspirated clicks are actually articulated more quickly <laughs> so it's almost like the the two clicks might take the, a similar amount of time which was what really our measurement was showing but that yeah if you actually measured the VOT as in what is after the burst I don't know if I've explained that clearly enough to people that 
aren't acoustic phoneticians, but um, yeah, it was just that there was an issue with the, how we chose to make the measurement as well, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And and what was the second comment that you made? I wanted to respond. I can't remember what it was. Uh, you mean about glottal constriction? Yes, the glottal. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, well, uh, even when you look at a, a an a intervocalic glottal stop, ah uh, ah, uh, that was a nice stop. But sometimes it's ah uh, ah. Uh, you know, it's it's more of like a, fr a fricative almost, or a, it can even be more like an approximate and not a full period of silence but just yes. a little bit of a constriction. Yeah, that's definitely true, especially, you know, definitely in Hadza, that's that's true of glottal stops in all languages that I'm aware of, but especially in Hadza, that's something I've noticed, you know, that you see more glottal constriction than a glottal stop. With regards to, this, to the click itself, as far as I've ever seen in all of my looking at it, um, I've only seen true silence, uh, which would, and, and the release of it does not typically create glottalization in the following vowel. It's just a release of the glottis, of the glottal closure straight into the voicing. Um, and so I would say it's more of a full, full, full closure than something like a glottal stop would be. I, I, you know, Kirk Miller and I listened to a bunch of tokens and sometimes we heard more larynx lowering, sometimes we heard more nasalizations. Yeah, but I, I agree with you, it tends to not be like a creaky voiced at all. Yeah. And Helen has raised her hands. Yeah, thanks. I'm not going to weigh in on anything to do with acoustic phonetics, but it's been really interesting. Thank you. Um, but I did want to ask, have you done anything to do with speaker perception of these different sounds? Um, I'm used to doing that a lot with my work, and it's usually to do with writing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be just um, asking people whether they perceive sounds as similar or not. Do they categorize them differently? Have you ever tried anything like that? Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I would say nothing formally. I haven't done any formal types of, you know, perception study um, other than just kind of in conversation try, like, as I'm trying to produce it and them correcting me saying, oh, no, you know, you're not producing this this way, you're producing it this way. And definitely I, if I don't aspirate a click correctly, they'll, they'll say, no, that's you're saying something. It sounds funny. And even if they can't articulate what exactly it is that I'm doing incorrectly, they're not saying, well, you're not aspirating. But they say something you're saying sounds a little bit funny. Um, I do get comments like that. So never have I done it try to intentionally try to elicit perception. But in anecdotally, yes, I have noticed some of those things that it is salient to them. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Helen, so Kirk Miller in, in doing his dictionary, it seemed like he working with Mariam Wanyuri, one of the two speakers in the recording that Jeremy played, she often had to ask her mother uh, for judgments about aspiration on different words. So it seemed like some of her, um, you know, she, that there was less certainty. And maybe that has to do with the fact that aspiration is not written in Swahili. But, you know, I don't think she had issues with ejectives or globalization to the same extent as with aspiration. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I know for me, definitely there are speakers who were better at pointing it out and mentioning that I was doing something incorrectly than others, you know, were at pointing out those types of things. Um, but having, I, I now that I think about it, I wish I would have put a picture of what the aspirated versus unaspirated clicks look like in terms of the waveform and spectrogram, because it's actually quite clear uh, when you look at it, but also when you listen to it, um, some speakers almost have a bit of a, a fricated uh, release of the aspiration sounds are more fricated of the of, of the posterior release uh, Bonnie I think you know what I'm talking about sometimes where you hear this kind of fricated yeah I would agree and I was wondering if if that uh, fricated noise on the aspirated release especially after clicks in Af africates might tend to go with a little bit shorter VOT you know and so that might you know have obscured the statistics on some of those numbers for that reason it's possible. I haven't looked specifically at that, but that's definitely possible. And we know that this is true of, you know, speakers who have much more affricated releases. So, for example, the ejective stop, the ejective velar stop, um, I didn't show it here in this talk, but 
there are, I have speakers who do a clear ejective stop and those who do a clear ejective velar affricate. So much more uh, versus uh. Um, and so I wonder if the same thing, if those are the ones who also do more of the fricated click aspiration release as opposed to those who do not. It's an interesting thought, um, but it's not, not, not something I've looked at. Just as a side note, I'm working with the closest speaking student right now who she has a bit more of that dorsal frication on her clicks compared to Zulu speakers that she's working with. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. definitely kind of an underrepresented uh, aspect of the phonetics. Yeah, definitely not talked about. Yeah. Except in languages where it's a contrastive phoneme having yes. that <laughs> sound. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I think those were all the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in Rift Valley webinar series can be found on Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 4th of October, presented by Helen Eaton, and it is titled Class Changing Derivation in Sandawe. I would like to thank Jeremy again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.